Our program today uh, is called Charlottesville to the Capitol. Uh, our uh, guest, uh, Amy, has a media interview at the bottom of the hour at uh, 8.30 our time based on the Atlanta shootings. So we've shifted our framework to have uh, Amy speak first. Uh, we will have Dick Bunce's uh, reflection and I will have some comments about Dick inspiring my portion of today's program. Then I will speak about accountability and uh, et cetera, and, and we will finish up on time. So uh, many of you will remember that uh, Amy spoke with us uh, last year. Uh, she's head of Integrity First for America and has uh, a broad career in government and politics and advocacy, uh, including communications director and senior policy advisor for the New York Attorney General. Uh, she's been a communication advisor and spokesman for the New York City Mayor and communications director for uh, the New York State Senate. Uh, she's done a lot of media work, but the importance is the work she's doing at uh, Integrity First for America. She'll be speaking today to update us on their lawsuit arising out of the Charlottesville uh, murderous rally, and then the fact that uh, a new lawsuit has been filed under the Ku Klux Klan Act arising uh, out of the January 6th insurrection. So uh, Amy, I'm thrilled you're here. I'm grateful that you were able to shift your schedule and be with us today. And uh, I'm eager to uh, turn this over to you. Well, thank you much so much, Steve. And thank you to all of you, particularly those who I think have gotten up quite early on the West Coast to join us. So I'm grateful. Um, before I dive into an update on our work in the Charlottesville lawsuit and, and the many, many developments that have happened both in our case and more broadly since we last spoke, I wanted to share a short video. It's a two minute video that I think will remind us all sort of what happened in Charlottesville, bring us back to three and a half years ago. And I do like to warn people before showing this that of course there are some disturbing images and sounds giving the nature of, of what we're talking about here. Um, and so if uh, if anyone wants to step away or just uh, turn off the Zoom for two minutes, I want to give them the opportunity to do so. Um, but with that, I will share my screen to share this video and then we'll dive into the conversation. Charlottesville. Dark displays of racism. to promote my car has rammed into a crowd. Victims thrown in the air. Deadly act of domestic terror. One woman dead. Others children wounded. Ten of the people who were injured in Charlottesville, including three of the people who were hit by that car and survived, have now brought a lawsuit against not only the murderer who drove his vehicle into the crowd, but also the leaders of all of the white nationalist groups that organized and promoted the Charlottesville event. We are Integrity First for America. We are here to disrupt the extremism, to interrupt the cycle, to dismantle and bankrupt these hate groups and their leaders, to put them out of business, and most importantly, to stop the violence. Integrity First for America is leading the fight against white supremacy. Our Charlottesville lawsuit is the only current legal effort taking on the broad leadership of this movement, holding white supremacists accountable for their premeditated violence. We know that it's working. They're already facing huge financial and legal consequences. But we also know what we're up against. Bankrupting Nazis isn't cheap. These groups are still recruiting, weaponizing fear, and preparing for their next attack. Now more than ever, we are reminded of our obligation to dismantle the systems of white supremacy that poison this country. Turn your outrage into action, because hate has no place here. So. 
Uh, I, I'm mean, obviously that that video. I think you know. I, I see it nearly every day, and still every time I see it, I feel this sort of like lump in my throat uh, because it's still stunning to me that that something like that could happen in this country. And at the same time, we've seen over and over again over the last three and a half years that it wasn't an isolated incident, but rather a flashpoint and a preview of the violence that's followed. And it certainly culminated in many ways on January 6th. And of course, the, the broader cycle of violence, including the attacks this week in Atlanta against Asian American women, um, are part of this larger cycle of white supremacist violence that has deep roots, not just in the emboldenment and enabling of, of extremism as we saw in Charlottesville, but of course, much deeper um, challenges. And so before uh, I sort of dive into some of the updates, I thought it might be worth giving a two minute refresher on the nuts and bolts of our lawsuit. Um, I think many of you, uh, if you were on, our, on the last call I joined might remember um, that our suit is not a speech case, but rather a conspiracy case. It's a case that based on extensive social media chats that are all detailed in our lawsuit, details how the violence in Charlottesville was not an accident, but rather planned for months in advance on these social media sites, including on a site called Discord, where the neo-Nazis and white supremacists discussed every detail in advance down to discussions of whether they could hit protesters with cars and then claim self-defense which is of course precisely what they did during a weekend of violence that you just saw detailed in that video. Um, and of course, it's worth noting that the violence in Charlottesville didn't, end, didn't start and end with the car attack, but was truly a, a weekend of violence from the Tiki Torch March on Friday night, in which a number of our plaintiffs were surrounded on the UVA campus um, as these neo-Nazis chanted, Jews will not replace us in blood and soil and threw fuel and lit torches, kicked, punched, beat them up. One of our plaintiffs, an African-American undergrad at the university said he thought he was gonna die. The violence of course continued the next day, including um, when they surrounded the small local synagogue in downtown Charlottesville, chanting Sieg Heil, carrying semi-automatic guns um, and threatening to torch the synagogue. Um, which had to evacuate both congregants and Torah scrolls out the back. Similarly, these neo-Nazis and white supremacists drove white Mercedes vans specifically around the black neighborhoods of Charlottesville to terrorize those communities. They charged a line of interfaith clergy who had been peacefully protesting, including another one of our plaintiffs, Reverend Seth Whispelway. And the day culminated, as was promised in those online chats, with the car attack that killed Heather Heyer and injured many of our other plaintiffs, as you saw in that video. And so that wasn't an accident, but rather that was a meticulously planned conspiracy to bring violence to Charlottesville, to target people based on their race, their religion, and their willingness to defend the rights of others. And as it turns out, we have laws that are meant to protect against that. And so our plaintiffs, um, who are an incredibly brave coalition of Charlottesville residents injured in that violence, filed suit in October of 2017 under a number of statutes, but the one that is most of note and I think will be a big point of discussion here today is something called the Ku Klux Klan Act of 1871. And this was a law that was passed exactly 150 years ago. Next month will literally mark the 150th anniversary of the passage of the KKK Act. Um, and it was meant to protect recently freed slaves from Klan vigilante violence in the South in which Klansmen would use the threat of violence to terrorize these black Americans and try to strip them of their recently won 13th, 14th and 15th amendment rights. It was meant to protect against <laughs> these sorts of racist conspiracies to undermine our civil rights. Um, and that is of course, precisely what happened in Charlottesville. And as we've seen over and over again, what has happened a number of times since. Um, and as Steve mentioned, uh, we've now seen two lawsuits emerge from the Capitol insurrection brought by two separate members of Congress, Representative Benny Thompson and Representative Eric Swalwell, um, who use a different section of the KKK Act, but the same overall statute to hold accountable those that they allege are responsible for that violent conspiracy. And so, it's stunning to me that 150 years after it was first passed, the KKK Act is newly relevant, not just through our suit, but through these capital lawsuits as well. And it's a sad testament to the alarming rise in violent white supremacy and violent extremism 
that has become so emboldened and so pervasive over the last few years. Um, to step back a bit, I think it's worth thinking, uh, understanding both how our lawsuit fits into this broader landscape of hate and also share some of the updates in our case since we last spoke. Um, most notably, um, we are officially headed to trial this October in federal court in Charlottesville. We were supposed to head to trial last fall and then COVID put a wrench in that much like it did with everything else happening in our world. And uh, we are now scheduled for trial in October in the Western District of Virginia. Um, we thought it was very important to do this as a jury trial. Um, we could have tried to do this as a virtual bench trial, which would have meant a trial just before the judge. Um, but we think that there is particular power in having a jury of Virginia residents hold accountable these extremists for the violence that they orchestrated. And we know throughout history, trials like this have been enormously powerful in forcing a public reckoning and shaping the public discourse on an issue. You can go back to the Prop 8 case about a decade ago in California, which was critical in shaping the marriage equality discussion and fight. You can go back to the Scopes Monkey trial and so many trials in between that have really been not just about the trial and the parties themselves, but flashpoints and touch points in a much broader social and political debate about who we are as a country and the values we're supposed to represent. And uh, we truly believe that this trial can play that role on this issue, on the issue of violent white supremacy and extremism. And when we put these extremists on trial in Charlottesville this fall, holding them accountable on the stand before a jury of their of Virginia residents, um, that will have that power. It will, it will hopefully grasp the national attention um, in a way that while well, we've had instances like the Capitol attack that have done so, we need a broader reckoning and we need to make clear the the accountability and the justice and consequences you will face if you are part of this sort of violence. Um, even before trial though, we've seen very extensive impacts of the lawsuit. Um, we have won a number of motions for sanctions uh, against the defendants, including huge financial pen penalties, um, even jail time for two defendants, which is extraordinarily rare in a civil case like ours and speaks to how flagrantly the defendants have flouted their court orders. They've been held in contempt of court and had bench warrants issued for their arrest as a result. And most notably for the lawyers on the call, um, this is a wonky win that I think most most media and the average American would not necessarily understand, understandably so. Um, but for the lawyers on the call, you might recognize the value of winning what uh, in November, something called adverse inferences or evidentiary sanctions against Nicole, these defendants. And what this means is, is that um, the judge will instruct the jury at trial to treat as an established fact that one of the core defendants in our suit, Elliot Klein, who is one of the two lead organizers of the Unite the Right, conspired to bring violence to Charlottesville. And that's the core allegation of our lawsuit, as I just described. And so the fact that we have won this adverse inference against him, that will now be an established fact at trial, means for all intents and purposes, we've effectively won the core argument of our lawsuit against Klein. And in a conspiracy case like this, in which you don't need to prove that every single member of the conspiracy directly actually drove the car or wielded the bat, or, um, but rather just had an agreed agreement to bring that violence. Um, it's an enormously powerful decision that um, our lawyers in the hundreds of combined years, they've all been practicing law say, no, no one has seen a decision quite like this. And so we are particularly thrilled about that. And I think it's a testament alongside the other um, motions we've won in over the last few years, the strength of our case and um, how good we feel going into trial this fall. But of course, we until we win those large civil judgments from the jury, um, we won't be satisfied. Um, and the last thing I'll say about the case itself before I sort of step back and, and talk a little bit about the landscape of, of broader white supremacist violence and then take your questions, um, is that we've already seen not just the penalties and the consequences these defendants face in our, through the sanctions and the other um, consequences I just described. But we've also seen the very real financial and operational impact it's had. So I might have mentioned to you last time we spoke, it probably had just happened, but Richard Spencer, who until recently was the country's leading neo-Nazi, is a defendant in our suit and has said our case has financially crippled him. 
Other defendants have talked about how they can't open a new headquarters because of our case. They can't go about their, um, their business as usual. They're unable to, to perpetuate their activities in the way that had been possible for so long because we've had such a financial and operational impact on them through these sanctions and through other accountability they've faced. And when we win large financial judgments from the jury at trial, that impact will be infinitely greater. And so through this case, it's not just about the message it sends, the deterrent effect it has, the public reckoning it will fuel, but also the very tangible and concrete ability to bankrupt and dismantle the leaders and the groups that are at the center of this movement. The last thing I'll say is, is sort of how our case fits into this broader crisis of violent white supremacy and violent extremism. We know and we have for some time that our defendants truly are central to this movement. The leaders and the groups that were taking on the two dozen individuals and hate groups responsible for orchestrating the violence in Charlottesville have deep and disturbing connections to the broader cycle of violence. We know that the Pittsburgh shooter who killed 11 Jews praying in synagogue two and a half years ago communicated with some of the Charlottesville leaders before their attack. We know that the Christ Church shooter who just exactly, almost exactly two years ago, killed dozens of Muslims praying in mosque in New Zealand, donated to two of our defendants, Spencer and Anglin, and separately painted a white power symbol onto his gun that was popularized by a third. And Christ Church was live streamed on social media and in turn inspired the Poway attack near San Diego at a Chabad there two years ago, the El Paso attack that targeted the Latinx community in Texas. Um, and a whole host of other white supremacist attacks. And now, of course, with the Capitol attack just a few months ago, and so and the broader rise in hate crimes and extremism, we're seeing other alarming parallels and, um, and connections. We wrote in the aftermath of the Capitol attack about the many parallels that exist between Charlottesville and the Capitol. Um, and I think Alexis will probably drop in the, she just did the op-ed that um, details those parallels. I won't go into all of them now, although I'm happy to if, if folks want to discuss during Q&A. Um, but suffice it to say the ways in which Charlottesville really previewed the sort of tools and tactics we saw at the Capitol is something that is critically important to understand. And as I mentioned earlier, the ways in which our lawsuit is now emerging as a model for accountability there through these KKK Act lawsuits that have been brought by members of Congress, and hopefully through larger scale conspiracy cases that we expect DOJ to continue to bring against the insurrectionists, we've already started to see some of them. Um, this will also make clear that there are very real consequences for being parts of this violent extremism. Um, and while over the last four years, there has been certainly a lack of consequence, except for our case and a handful of others, we are now in a different era and there's an opportunity here to make those consequences clear and hold these extremists accountable, which is what our work at IFA in this case is all about. Um, and also, we hope can really be a model for, for so many of these other efforts to hold accountable these violent extremists. Um, so I will leave it there and happy to answer any and all questions. And Steve can tell me if there are other parts of this work that I missed in my presentation that you'd like me to focus on. Yes, you do this so well, Amy. Uh, I wanted to uh, ask you two uh, questions. Uh, as recently as yesterday, a member of Congress uh, was speaking against uh, using a hate crime analysis regarding the Atlanta uh, killings. And he invoked the First Amendment. And uh, I think virtually everybody on this call knows how much uh, the First Amendment means to me. But there has already been a ruling in your case on the First Amendment defense uh, raised by some of the defendants. And I, I'd appreciate your uh, just uh, explaining and developing that for our group. Absolutely. And you can certainly probably speak to this even better than me. So please feel free to jump in and I and your LA review of books piece, which um, we can uh, make sure we we share in the chat at some point, um, I think does a, a great job de delving into this as well as it relates to our case, and of course, more broadly. Um, but but you're absolutely right to what you're alluding to, which is that while you and I and I assume everyone on this call hold the First Amendment very sacred, it's also is never was never meant and has never been meant to protect violence. That is not what speech is about. 
Um, and in our case, as you can imagine, the defendants filed motions to dismiss the case in early 2018. And in a July of 2018 ruling from the judge, Judge Moon, he made very clear, citing extensive precedent, that the First Amendment does not protect violence. And if these extremists had simply gone to Charlottesville and stood on the street corner with their swastikas and their anti-Semitic and racist and bigoted cha uh, chants and their general heinous behavior um, and ideas, that would have been totally permissible, as abhorrent as I find it, and as I'm sure everyone on this call finds it. Um, but that's not what they did. They went to Charlottesville with the intent to bring violence to that community. Um, they planned it in meticulous detail on social media, and then they did it, um, as, as I just described, and as our lawsuit really describes in alarming detail. And so that's not protected by the First Amendment, nor are um, a number of the other incidents of violence and extremism that we've seen in recent years. Um, the other thing to note that is often used, particularly by the right, is this idea that social media companies have an obligation to give anyone a platform for their extremism. And this is a debate that I expect to see evolve in the coming months as well. And there have been some efforts by members of Congress to begin to, to start this conversation and figure out how within the bounds of a free and fair internet, we can also ensure that companies are incentivized to not give create an algorithm that effectively not just elevates extremism, but sends people down the rabbit hole and radicalizes them in ways we've never seen before. Um, and that's not what the, that's not what these social media companies are obligated to do, just like in any private space, whether it be a real world space or a virtual space, there are terms of service, there are the terms that we agree to as, as customers or users of that space, the same way we as people who participate in university life or any other entity that's a private space agree to those terms. And so social media companies have every right, if they would like to limit the extremism, the violence, the harassment that happens on their platform, but there's been an effort among particularly far right leaders to suggest that they don't, that, that somehow the First Amendment protects their right to use and exploit social media to plan violence, to, um, to harass people and threaten people. Um, and so I suspect that this is also a conversation that will be evolving in the public sphere over the coming months. Um, and I hope that there are ways that we can su successfully thread the needle, protecting a free and open internet, obviously protecting speech, but making clear that social media companies have an obligation and a moral responsibility here to, to stop the cycle of radicalization that has run rampant on their platforms and the use of their platforms, the exploitation of their platforms to plan violence and, and, uh, and, and more. Um, and so I think there's a lot of discussion right now happening around the First Amendment that doesn't fully grasp what the First Amendment is. And it's so important for those who are civil liberties advocates and experts to make clear those distinctions, which is why I'm grateful to Steve for his piece on this front and his leadership here. And I think many of you as well, I'm sure have been outspoken in this regard. Uh, we have a few questions. I just wanna ask my second one. Would you expand on the recent use of the Ku Klux Klan Act in the two civil lawsuits brought by members of Congress? Yeah, absolutely. So there, so there are two cases, as you said. The first was brought by Representative Benny Thompson and the NAACP, and the second was brought by Representative Eric Swalwell. And I, and there are a few law firms that are involved with both cases. I forget exactly who. Um, I think technically Paul Weiss, which is doing pro bono work in our case, is involved with one of them, if my recollection is correct. But I could be muddying that with their work on. Uh, against the, the Proud Boys who attacked the Black Church in DC in January. Um, there have been so many incidents of, of violence and, and uh, an increasing number of responses to it, which is good that you can't keep track of some of these cases. The major difference between the congressional lawsuits and in our case is the section of the Ku Klux Klan Act that they use. There's a number of sections with it in the KKK Act. I'm not going to bore you all by walking through them, nor do I purport to be an expert in some of in the ones that don't directly relate to our, our work. Um, but the, the Swalwell and the Benny Thompson lawsuits specifically use section one, which are meant to protect against conspiracies that undermine, effectively undermine our government officials' ability to conduct their duties. 
Um, that is that is uh, a very specific section of the KKK Act that, of course, given what happened on January 6th, the ways in which the insurrection was used to undermine Congress's ability to uh, uh, to confirm the elections results, the election results seems to be a fairly direct application there. Uh, and I'm sure Steve and others can dive into that a bit more. The section that we use is section three, um, which specifically protects against these sorts of racially motivated conspiracies to undermine other private citizens' rights, civil rights. And it talks a lot in the, in the statute about, for example, the badges and incidences of slavery, how you are effectively through these conspiracies intending to re-enslave it for all intents and purposes. Um, the, the, the victims, the plaintiffs, um, and certainly if you look at what happened in Charlottesville, the ways in which, for example, our plaintiffs were surrounded on the UVA campus and beaten and punched and had fuel and torches thrown at them, um, and with the language, the racism, the other forms of hate that underpinned that conspiracy, it's it's hard not to see the direct applicability, which again, the, the court has said, if we if, if we prove the facts as alleged in our complaint, um, the, the KKK Act does indeed imply, and there's also some strong precedent there, particularly a case called Griffin v. Breckenridge from, I believe, the 70s, um, and a number of cases involving freedom writers and others throughout history that have used this statute. Um, of course, the 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 use of the statute is an interesting parallel to the evolution of violent white supremacy in this country, but the fact, as I said earlier, that it's so applicable in 2021, not just in our case, but in these other cases, is a sad testament to the alarming rise in, in violent white supremacy. I see a question from Thank Michael. You. Yeah, I wanted to, uh, you know, underline the importance of the uh, suit. Let me see if I can lower my hand here. Um, uh, there have been, you know, previous uh, uh, a number of previous uh, significant uh, civil actions that were brought. There was a civil action that was brought against Tom Metzger and War over the killing of Mulugeta Sarai in, in Portland. Uh, in the uh, going back to the uh, Greensboro massacre, the only successful uh, court action was a civil action. The 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 uh, Klansmen and Nazis who killed people in Greensboro, North Carolina, in 1979 were acquitted in criminal trials in, in state court and in federal court. And the only accountability was the civil action. So I, I, I really support what you're doing. I think it's really uh, critical. I, I do donate. I just wanted to mention for everybody's awareness that uh, one of the reasons you're able to bring this trial is that someone hacked the uh, Discord uh, planning. Discord is a uh, gamers network uh, that uh, the, uh, the people involved in this used to uh, chat with each other about their plans, and those were released to uh, a group uh, called Unicorn Riot that distributed them publicly. And in the second round, they had a, after their their first uh, set of discords were released, uh, and a number of them were outed as to who they really were. Uh, they had a second round in which they uh, decided that I was the leader of Antifa and uh, tried to uh, uh, dox me, uh, except I've always been very, very public with anti-racism. It was no surprise to anybody. Uh, so they continued in their efforts to uh, uh, try to uh, attack the people who were uh, exposing them. And I think uh, you know what you're doing, therefore, is uh, quite brave uh, to uh, persist in this effort. And uh, just wanted to say that uh, uh, that's important. Uh, you know, just recently was the anniversary of the uh, uh, break in at the FBI that uh, revealed uh, the existence of COINTELPRO and that uh, there are some forms of uh, action which are not necessarily legal that uh, uh, have contributed to our ability to understand what's going on in the society and the uh, roots of uh, uh, racism and repression that uh, I think are also worthy of upholding. Thanks. I wholeheartedly agree. I don't, I'm not sure I have anything. I need to add anything. I think that was incredibly yeah, uh, I was, and informative. So I, for the sake of time, I, I wholeheartedly agree. And we'll... <laughs> I wasn't sure if there was a question in there. Uh, I think Steve has his hand up. Amy, uh, again, two parts. Without uh, tipping your hand on any trial strategy, um, if it's a matter of public record in the court filings in terms of witness lists and uh, expert witnesses, et cetera. Uh, how do you see the trial playing out? Will it be televised or 
will we be able to keep track of the trial uh, and whether you're going to use it to educate the public on the nature of white supremacy through the expert witnesses or other witnesses? And secondly, what remedies uh, at the end of the case what are you asking the jury and the judge uh, to do? Absolutely. So on the first, um, the short answer is yes, absolutely. The part of the, the goal here and part of IFA's work is to use this case to make sure we are driving public engagement and education on this crisis. And I think few things illustrate both the crisis of extremism and also the ways in which these leaders and these groups operate better than our lawsuit. Because as Michael said, these chats that were leaked in the in the aftermath of Unite the Right really illustrate in such explicit detail how they operate, how meticulously planned this was, how they they go about this in a, in a way that I think has um, largely, you know, in, when the KKK Act was passed 150 years ago, we didn't have social media chats serving as evidence in these cases. And I think it illustrates it in, in quite a, a stunning way. Um, and that's the goal here. Um, we do not know if it'll be tele televised. There are a number of, of local television stations in Charlottesville that I suspect will be asking the court for the ability to televise it. In federal court, it's, it's sort of an open question and, and it's left up to the judge. Um, and so certainly we believe that there's a public interest here and, uh, and I suspect that as we approach trial, we'll, have, we'll know more about where that's headed, but I know that many local television stations and other entities will be making that case. Um, and similarly, regardless of, of what, what the judge decides on that front, we at IFA will be putting out daily updates on what is happening at the case through our email list, if you're on it, um, through our social media channels, if you follow us on any of those places, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, I think we're on LinkedIn, who knows, there's all these sites, we might even join TikTok if you're on that. Um, but we will be making sure to use all of the tools we have um, to keep our supporters updated of uh, what's happening in court, who has testified, what the gist was, um, and if it's not televised, as sharing as much information as we can in that format. Um, in terms of what to expect, I think, of course, put it beyond putting our plaintiffs and our, our the defendants on the stand. Um, and I should note that, of course, we've we've been through at this point two plus years of discovery of evidence collection in this case. And one of the one of the details that sticks with me most is how when some of our plaintiffs have have given their depositions, and our legal team has been defending those depositions. Um, they tell the story of what happened to them. They share their experiences, which are of course detailed in our lawsuit. But when you hear them tell them, it's stunning in a way that 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 of course you know written words can't do justice to. And so one our one of our attorneys who was defending the deposition of one of our plaintiffs texted me afterwards to say that he had looked over to the court reporter. Um, who was transcribing the deposition, and she was crying like silently as she as our as our plaintiff was sharing the story of what happened to her. And I think that that is, of course, a testament to how horrific what our plaintiff survived was, but also the power of making sure that jury and the broader world hears their story during trial, and that will certainly be a big part of it. Um, we also have on our website expert witness reports that have been, so some of that, so a lot in this case is under seal and under protective order, as you can imagine, but um, increasingly we're able to release bits and pieces of, of the expert witness reports and other elements. And so we have three expert witness reports on our website, two academic experts in white supremacy who have a really stunning report on how sort of a lot of what the defendants will use as their, ex as their uh, excuses. And so if Alexis, if you can actually put the page to the full list of expert witness reports, which is under case documents in the chat, that would be better than just this one direct report. Um, and so we have Pete Simi and Kathleen Blee who are academic experts in, in white supremacy and how they oftentimes will say that they're joking that they're just, you know, joking around, which will be a big part of their defense, which of course uh, is a common white supremacist tactic. And, and Kathleen and Pete and other uh, will we'll detail that in the many other ways in which Charlottesville really aligns with longstanding white supremacist tactics. Um, we also have Deborah Lipstadt, who I, I'm sure some on this call is are have have probably mixed feelings about. 
Um, but I think the importance of having a diversity of, ide of ideological views when it comes to anti-Semitism, white supremacy, and extremism, all advocating in support of our plaintiffs um, through their expertise is particularly powerful here. And, and Deborah's report dives into how what we saw in Charlottesville really harkens back to longstanding white supremacist and Nazi tactics and language and imagery. And then we also have, of course, an expert who has reconstructed the car attack, um, which is important because it illustrates the, the deliberate nature of it, the fact that he went in, he backed up, he went back in. Um, and it speaks to, again, the horror and the, and the extensive Im uh, injuries, both physically and psychologically, that the plaintiff suffered. Um, so those are three reports that are available on our website right now for anyone who really wants to dive in there. Um, we will have, of course, additional, plenty of additional testimony in this case um, that including anything most, like I said, most powerfully from the plaintiffs. I believe there was a second question there. Thank but you. I yeah, actually, I think there are two others. I just wanted to make sure uh, we're at 818 and you have to leave at 830. Is that? Yes. OK, so if we can keep the questions really brief so we have more time for response. And if you could also, before you leave, um, tell us if there's anything specifically we can do besides following the case that would help support um, the work. I can do that briefly now if that's helpful. Okay, uh, sure. Well, uh, so I don't forget at 1130. Um, I think, look, the two things that are most important to this work. First and foremost, we want people to know that this exists that there is a concrete, tangible way to take action against violent white supremacy. And at a time when many people are feeling powerless and hopeless and scared, this is a very concrete way to take action. And as I discussed earlier, not just to bankrupt and dismantle the defendants in our suit and create that deterrent effect and that and that reckoning that we hope happens around trial, but also as a model, serves as a, to serve as a model for other cases and other accountability that we hope comes out of the broader cycle of white supremacist and extremist violence, including the Capitol, including some of the cases that we hope DOJ will continue to bring both on the criminal and civil front. Um, and so spreading the word in whatever form people can is so enormously powerful, um, whether it be through your congregations and your communities, the organizations you're involved with. We have a toolkit on our website for, uh, we have multiple toolkits on our website. We have an activist toolkit with samples of media company content. We have a clergy toolkit that gives clergy members the ability to, um, to sort of you take information that we're providing and turn it into a sermon or some other resource for their community. Um, and for those who are observing Passover, we also just released our 2021 Passover Seder supplement. Uh, which is at integrityfirstforamerica.org slash Seder. And it's just a two page document that, uh, that sort of slips right into your Passover Seder or your interfaith Seder, which I know many people have um, and allows uh, you to sort of talk, uh, use a holiday that's so focused on justice and freedom and liberation to talk about the modern day fight for those values and those needs. Um, and so those are some of the tools we have. The second thing is to be completely frank, while the legal work in our case is pro bono, there are, of course, extensive financial needs, particularly related to security, which is the largest line item in our budget. So for those who know people who might be interested in financially supporting this work, you should know that every donation directly supports security and ev ed evidence collection um, in this case. So it's not going to fancy legal fees. Our, our legal team, we estimate, will have donated over $25 million in legal work by the time trial is through, um, if not more. Um, but rather it's going specifically to security and other needs like that, given the threats and harassment the defendants uh, have continued to uh, lodge against us, to put it lightly. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and we can follow up on those. Uh, let's quickly, uh, Dave, have your question. Yes. Um, I wonder if there have been any cases where a white supremacist organizations or the right wing generally has attempted to use the legal system to penalize uh, peace and justice activists on the grounds that some uh, organizational activities of theirs resulted in damage to property or uh, personal injury. Uh, have there been any cases 
uh, civil cases like the one that you're filing filed by white supremacists or are there are there examples of law enforcement using the legal system to punish uh, peace and justice activists thank you it's a good question. I'm not aware of any case that sort of specifically does that, at least that has been successful, that has made, that has survived a motion to dismiss. It's very possible that there are, and Steve and others on this might know about sort of cases that use this specific sort of, like use the strategy we're using in reverse. Um, there are, I think someone talking about slap lawsuits, which absolutely ap apply here sort of more broadly and have been used. And, and in New York, for example, I think that just there was an anti-slap law that's passed. And, and there's uh, uh, lawyers like Steve and others who can probably speak to this in far more articulately than I can. Um, what has a few things that your question prompted that I want to know. One, there is actually um, a, a prosecutor in St. Louis, I believe, who is using a section of the KKK Act against the police there for their violations of people's civil rights. So in fact, there are other applications of this that, and while I don't know what will come of that, these lawsuits don't move quickly as, as you can tell from ours. Um, and there's a ways to go before we we know the, I, I don't even know where that, that case currently stands. I don't know if it's even been through the motion to dismiss at this point. Um, but clearly there are way, there are people thinking about how we also use this against the other systemic ways white supremacy works, including among police. And so that's, I think, an interesting point. I do know that, for example, Jason Kessler, who's one of the defendants in our lawsuit, the Kessler and Signs v. Kessler, which is the name of our suit, um, has brought suit against, for example, the city of Charlottesville, alleging a whole host of things that ways in which they supposedly didn't protect his rights. And I, I don't think that that suit is going to be that successful, but um, there are efforts to use sort of the, this, this to pretend to be the victim in the justice system by extremists that way. And the last thing I'll say is also that your question raised um, sort of an important point that I think will come up around the debate around a domestic terror statute. And a number of civil rights groups have, have been outspoken about the fact that, including us, that we have the tools we need to take on extremism now in our justice system. We have criminal and civil tools. We haven't had a DOJ that was willing to do so over the last four years, but hopefully that's changing. But now with this debate about whether we need a new domestic terror statute, there are very real concerns that some will use a statute like that against Black Lives Matter or against other civil rights groups. Um, and, I, I, and so I think about like 50 or so um, groups like the Leadership Conference for Civil Rights have put out a letter to that effect talking about uh, talking about those concerns. And I think what you're raising is something that I know many civil rights groups, us included, are thinking about in the course of this debate to make sure that in this effort to take on white supremacy and violent extremism, there aren't laws being put on the books that can be further abused against Black Lives Matter and others, um, other civil rights activists. Well, I can add to that uh, there was a lawsuit brought by a police officer in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, against DeRay McKesson. Yes, yes, that's who, a good point. Right? Who was an organizer for Black Lives Matter, and they held a rally in protest uh, against a police shooting by a police officer. During that rally, a police officer was hit by a rock and injured. No one has been able to identify who threw the rock. Instead, the police officer sued Black Lives Matter and DeRay McKesson. And unfortunately, until uh, a recent ruling, the case was upheld by the Louisiana courts on the theory of negligence, that because Black Lives Matter called a protest because one random person threw a rock and injured a police officer, uh, Black Lives Matter and McKesson could be sued. Uh, the court held that Black Lives Matter is a movement, not an organization, so that part was thrown out. But uh, up until last November, the case against McKesson was gonna go to trial, not because he had conspired, not because he had done anything knowingly. And fortunately, uh, the current conservative Supreme Court uh, dismissed 
the, that ruling, uh, it sent the case back for clarification, but essentially uh, it was not buying the mere negligence standard. And as we finish here, as Amy's been emphasizing the conspiracy and the evidence that she and her group have presented is a world of difference. But uh, you're right, Dave, uh, there have been efforts to turn the tables at times. Uh, and to my knowledge, uh, those have been unsuccessful. Okay, um, in respect of your time, Amy, any, any parting thoughts because we are at 828. No, well, well, thank you to all of you, not just for what you're doing uh, on this topic um, and your willingness to, to engage and support this effort, but more broadly, I think, you know, everyone rattling off their various causes and organizations at the beginning was a nice way to start the day because it's, 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 it's wonderful to just be in a virtual room of people who are doing so much um, for, for these values and, and to move the needle forward. Um, and so, so I, please, you know, don't hesitate to reach out. I, we put our contact information in the chat um, if we can be helpful. Um, I hope that the resources that we have for clergy and faith leaders, for activists and, and anyone in between are helpful, including the Passover resource, um, whether you are celebrating or anyone you know is celebrating or you're going to an interfaith theater. Um, and uh, please, like I said, don't hesitate to, to reach out if we can be helpful. Um, if you are interested in um, getting involved, whether it be through uh, you know, a virtual, like inviting your own communities to some of the virtual programs we do, which are happening quite frequently, please let us know and we can um, bring you into some of the virtual programs that we have on the calendar um, or uh, work with you in any other way to, to get out the word on this effort. Um, so really thank you to all of you and thank you to Steve and the whole team for uh, having me again. Thank you very much and hope the, the news conference goes well. We look forward to seeing it. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much.